I'm happy to say that as we begin this Saturday morning that, that all our, our pilgrims have returned. I see one or two heroic people who got up really early for this Mass today. So hopefully everyone got back safely, and uh, I, I just want to let you know that they, they have returned. Um, actually, it kind of freaked me out a bit because I thought they would be coming in tomorrow. And so I, saw, I heard someone in the rectory, I had my phone in one hand, and with my other hand I was ready to uh, de deal divine justice. And so I let Father, Father Mike know that he was, came very close to being, uh, being hit on the head. So today we celebrate, um, we, cel we continue this, this time of, of, of reflecting on the end times and reflecting on the book of Revelation. And remember that as we read the book of Revelation, we read with the mind of the church. We do not read Revelation with any less the mind of the church than we read Genesis, than we read uh, the epistle to the Corinthians, than we read the gospel of Matthew. And one of the things that as time goes on, as we discover sacred scripture, uh, and this has been true for me, we find more and more how it's an unbelievably coherent story. It is a, it has a, it has one voice as it were. That sacred scripture, even though it's this library of so many different books from different time periods and many, many, many different authors, uh, has this incredible harmony where it says something. And what does sacred scripture talk about? It talks about Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this reading today, you know, we have this more of this kind of confusing imagery with these two tree, olive trees and these lamps. And, uh, and one of the things, and then also these people that, that appear to be, to be slain and then they kind of come back. And what I'll say about that is, is that uh, as far as these actual images, you know, the olive, olive was, a, was used for anointing, anointing kings. And uh, even in ordinations and such today, you know, olive oil is used. And lamps, of course, lamps creating light uh, to, to give light to the area. So there's signs of God's presence and God giving his authority. And I, I would think that the two people that are, we hear about in the story are, are people in the church, maybe even Peter and Paul, the apostles Peter and Paul, because both uh, Peter and Paul uh, witness to the Lord in their respective ways, obviously Peter more to the Jewish converts, Paul being sent after his conversion to the Gentile world, and both of them are slain by by, by bad people, right? They're slain, they're martyred, and yet they don't really die in a sense because although, of course, in the, the sense of, in the case of Peter and Paul, they, they, uh, they did die and after, you know, they, they have no resurrection or anything, but they, they, they continue, their authority continues on, right? Because they are, uh, they are part of the apostolic hierarchy. And so, and so the, you know, every Holy Father, every Pope we have uh, can trace his, his, uh, his gift of his, of his lineage in a sense back to, to St. Peter, that he has received responsibility St. Peter himself had that Christ gave him. And so I think that, that, that those are the people that we hear about. And the larger picture, of course, is this idea that evil does not triumph that even when it gets bad, that God is in charge. And evil is being allowed a time to, to do its thing, but evil does not have the last word. And so it really kind of makes that point. Then we go back into this, the gospel today. And, uh, you know, the gospel, we, we heard this not too long ago, uh, this reading uh, not very long ago. And the, the Sadducees, they're, they're, they're trying to trick Jesus into a situation where it will stump him or it will just kind of mess up his, his theology. And uh, they're really going for the throat here. And uh, it's important to understand the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection of the body or, or, or a resurrection of, they didn't really believe in life after death, things of that kind. And so Jesus challenges them and he affirms that there is a life after death. 
And that in that life, in that new life, marriage is not the most important thing. And why can you, how can he say that, right? Marriage is so important to people on earth. Obviously, the church has, you know, we have a sacrament of matrimony. Uh, you think about how important that is in culture. But uh, marriage is, is, in the church's eye, uh, a means to an end. It is a beautiful thing. It's a great gift. It's a sacrament. It's also a means to an end. And the purpose of, of holy matrimony is to help the couple get to know each other in light of God and to become saints and for them to be open to the gift of life and to get their children to be able to become holy as well. And so when you look at that, we realize how different the church's vision of marriage is from the actual marriages that you encounter in people's lives. And uh, I would also say with this that it's important and I even say this for people that might hear this uh, on YouTube or something, that you need to make sure that your marriage situation is okay with the church. You need to make sure that it's okay. And, and you need to, to ask yourself whether you have, you have, you're actually in the sacrament of matrimony because there are Catholics who have been uh, living in a mar married state for decades and decades, and it's not objectively right with the church. And then you got to get that taken care of. And so at this parish, I or Father Mike or Deacon Mike are here to help if your marriage situation is irregular and needs to be, to be, to be regularized. But that is your responsibility, and you need to, 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 be, to be serious about that and don't just kind of brush it off. So marriage is a great gift that is meant to help us become people that are citizens of heaven and help, us be a, help them be a light to others to help draw them into that kingdom.